Hi, and welcome to Conversations with B'nai B'rith International. I'm CEO Dan Mariashin. Thanks for spending some time with us today. If you enjoy our conversation series, make sure you subscribe to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and like us on Facebook or watch our latest interviews. And of course, be sure to visit our website, b'naibrith.org, to learn more about our humanitarian and advocacy efforts across the globe. Well, known as the father of the nuclear Navy, Admiral Hyman George Rickover remains an almost mythical figure in the United States Navy. His achievements, of which there are many, arguably saved the Navy from obsolescence against all odds. Yet, while Rickover served, his combative nature didn't win him any friends. He was rebellious in a Navy that prized conformity. In his new book, Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power, part of the Yale Jewish Lives series, Historian, journalist, and author Mark Wortman explores the constant conflict Rickover faced and provoked how his development of nuclear-propelled submarines and ships transformed naval power and Cold War strategy, and how he fundamentally changed the Navy. We're fortunate to have Mark with us today to delve into his fascinating new biography of Rickover and how a Jew born in a Polish shtetl became the longest-serving military officer in U.S. history. Mark Wortman is an independent historian and award-winning journalist. His previous books include 1941, Fighting the Shadow War, A Divided America in a World at War, and The Millionaire's Unit, The Aristocratic Flyboys Who Fought the Great War and Invented American Air Power. He's written articles on a wide range of subjects for Vanity Fair, Smithsonian, and Time magazines, and has appeared on CNN, NPR, the History Channel, and numerous other broadcast outlets. Mark, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Oh, thank you, Dan. It's an honor. Well, the first question to an author has to be, what drew you to this subject? Well, uh, what, what didn't draw me to him? What, what an extraordinary person, and what a, a, a fabulous life to, to explore. But uh, the, the nuts and bolts of it are, um, I had written, as, as you mentioned, uh, uh, some previous military history books, uh, uh, including one about uh, uh, an earlier uh, technology that was pioneering within the Navy, uh, aviation during World War I. Um, and so uh, I knew a fair amount about the Navy. I knew a fair amount about... Uh, uh, military history. Um, and then uh, uh, I can't say that I knew uh, the richness and depths and complexities of, of Rickover's career, but I was, a, I was aware of him um, and certainly understood that he had had a, a pioneering role. Uh, so uh, I had a conversation with uh, Eileen Smith, the um, uh, editor-in-chief of the Jewish Lives series, and we discussed various potential figures of interest, and you know, and I mentioned Rick Rickover, you know, knowing uh, uh, that uh, that he was such a prominent figure, and and she jumped at that, and so that was it was really um, a combination of factors, um, but uh, and also you know I would have done Sandy Koufax, but uh, she didn't jump at that one. Well, we'll wait for we'll wait for that title. I. I uh... Really, I uh, was a big fan, yeah. uh, but we'll yeah. we'll go back to Rickover. The subtitle of your book about Admiral Rickover is "Engineer of Power," which is a title that seems to work on on multiple levels. Was was that intentional? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So the um, you're publishing uh, pu publishing Inside Dope. So they they came to me and said, "Oh, I think we should call it Father of the Nuclear Navy." And I said, over my dead body, I said, this is to reduces him to such a small part of what he did and what his life was about. You know, so Rick over invented within his uh, within his organization, the uh, the practical nuclear reactor, uh, an extraordinary achievement. Uh, and he did this both for uh, submarines, uh, for larger naval vessels, and for the first civilian power utility, you know, the first uh, completely 
nuclear uh, electricity uh, generating power plant. You know, absolutely fundamental technologies that have transformed the world. They've transformed the world in naval strategy. They've transformed the world in how uh, leaders view uh, their uh, international affairs. I mean, right down to today, the, uh, the AUKUS uh, uh, alliance between the United States, Australia, and the United Kingdom comes directly out of what Rickover did 60 plus years ago. So we have, uh, he engineered power, but Rickover could stay in power uh, over the Navy's uh, reluctance and in fact, multiple efforts to force him out uh, because he was able to engineer political power. He knew how to get Washington to work on his behalf and on behalf of the of nuclear reactors. And this forced the Navy to basically toe the line for him. He used his power to force multiple reforms on a very resistant Navy and ended up, uh, despite the fact that the Navy wanted to retire him way back uh, when in the early 1950s, when he was working, first working on the, uh, the nuclear reactor, he was able to force the Navy to keep him in. Uh, in he became a, eventually a four-star admiral. You know, a Jew from a Polish shtetl, and he remained in the Navy from the time of Woodrow Wilson and the end of World War One until the time of Ronald Reagan and the, the beginnings of the end of the Cold War. It's an incredible stretch, and thus, uh, engineer of power really struck me as as the title that encapsulated that. I want to come back to, to the political connections on Capitol Hill and the interest mm -hmm. of those members of Congress in what he was doing. We'll, we'll do that a little bit later, but from your research, uh, was there evidence of Rickover's greatness when he was young? Uh, he, he was born in the Polish shtetl, uh, I believe family came here, he was six years old, settled in New York, and, and then and they went out to Chicago. Um, so at that point, already in Chicago, he's going to high school. Um, what what happened in that very brief period that propelled Rickover into a career in the Navy? Yeah. Um, you know, there are so many circumstantial moments that could have gone a different way. Uh, Rickover made a crack in uh, after he retired. Uh, about uh, when he came over on, uh, immigrated into the United States uh, and arrived with his mother. There, uh, there were circumstances that, uh, if you read the book, you'll learn about, but that uh, prevented her from leaving Ellis Island. And they were just on the verge of being deported back to uh, Poland. You know, these were impoverished people. And he said, um, there are lots of contractors who wish that, that he had indeed been sent back. But uh, so when he got to the United States, his family remained in poverty. He was working a full-time job from the time he was about nine years old and also going to school. Now, he always regretted that he couldn't focus more on his early education, but he still did pretty well. Well enough that when, again, through lucky circumstances, you know, that he had uh, a family member who had some connections to the local congressman who was able, uh, by pulling some strings, to get him a nomination to the Naval Academy. It never, you know, Rickover thought he was, uh, uh, his dream was to get a college education, and he never thought he was going to be able to. But this set of lucky circumstances uh, brought him into the Naval Academy in 1918. And, uh, you know, while at the Naval Academy, he did well. He didn't do brilliantly. There was nothing that said that this was the person that Jimmy Carter was going to one day call the greatest engineer uh, ever to live. And there was really, you know, very few things that said that he was anything other than a fighter and a hard worker. This was somebody who would outwork anybody, you know, who overcame uh, a Navy that, like the wider American society, 
had a lot of anti-Semitism in it. You know, uh, there were uh, literally just two handfuls of Jews at the Naval Academy when he went there, and all Jews were said to live in Coventry. That was uh, midshipmen speak for they got the silent treatment. Jews were never spoken to unless uh, forced uh, by necessity by the other midshipmen. So really uh, circumstances uh, could have gone the other way, but he, uh, he was a hard, hard worker. He was going to outwork everybody around him. And, uh, but he didn't, he didn't stand out in a way that somebody would have said looking at him, you know, this is, this is somebody who's just a genius. So let's uh, look at the, for a moment, the, the Jewish side of, of Hyman Rickover. I, I think you wrote that the issue that his mother had um, was at Ellis Island was that there was no one there. His father had not yet come to meet them. Mm-hmm. And that if, if you weren't met, you, you were deported back. I think it was 10 days. So actually, this story may, not, may, may never have taken place had, had they been deported and they gone back uh, to Poland. Uh, but they move to Chicago. And, and as you write, I think at, at one point where they're living, there's a synagogue next door. He gets bar mitzvahed. Uh, tell us a little about that part of his life. Yeah. Uh, well, there's, there's relatively little um, information that I was able to glean. Um, about his his early Jewish life, but he was bar mitzvahed. Uh, he uh, his given name Hyman Godalia Rickover uh, uh, was you know a, a Polish Yiddish name, um, uh, or uh, actually Chaim uh, Godalia Rickover, obviously uh, anglicized um, Hyman George, and uh, he he lived within a the. Jewish community in Lawndale, Chicago. Uh, he had, there were anti-Semitic incidents that he, he recalled, uh, uh, but uh, he was raised in an Orthodox family, grew up um, in a, a, a small apartment that was shared with other, uh, with other relatives. Um, and, uh, you know, was, you know, uh, very much in, in uh, standard Jewish traditions. But when he got to uh, the Naval Academy, you know, the very uh, he had to make some choices. The very first uh, meal that was put in front of him, and this is somebody who had been used to having very small frugal meals his whole life. The very first meal that was put in front of him uh, had a piece of ham on the plate, and uh, he basically had to make some choices there. Uh, and he decided that he was going to get his education, and he was going to. Uh, to live a life that uh, that was ma- going to be made possible by that education. Well, late late in life, actually, I think maybe the Chicago connection uh, was uh, at work here. Late in life, the neighbors honored him with mm-hmm. the uh, Klesnik Public Service Award, and Phil Klesnik, who was uh, president of B'nai B'rith, <clears throat> former Secretary of Commerce, and, and so many other things, was also from Chicago, and I think that maybe. Uh, maybe there was a connection uh, there as well. You also mentioned in terms of the Naval Academy, I, th- I think you wrote that there were 17, yeah. 17 Jews in this class. It was a very big class, but that it had winnowed down by the time they were ready to graduate to, to four or five. Um, yeah, I, think, I think seven in total managed to graduate. Yeah, yeah it, it, uh, there were... so. You know there were some serious anti-Semitic incidents that took place there. First, first we have to understand. You know, at the center of the Naval Academy in Annapolis is the the Great Episcopalian Chapel for, the, and all midshipmen were expected to attend religious services. So Jews and Catholics as well had to go off campus to to attend religious services, um, and um, the number one ranked. Uh, two two midshipmen were vying for the number one rank in their class, Rick Over's class at the Naval Academy. Uh, one uh, was Jewish, and the other was the editor of the uh, of the Naval Academy's uh, uh, yearbook called the Lucky Bag. And that editor, I guess, out of spite for his rival for the number one spot, which, uh, you know, could have a big effect on on your career within the Navy. He actually put 
uh, a page with uh, a caricature of this guy in it, um, all sorts of uh, anti-Semitic tropes in his biography of him. And he perforated the page and didn't include him in the index. So if any other midshipman wanted to simply tear it out, uh, which was sort of indicated by this perforation, that midshipman, his name was Leonard Kaplan, uh, would cease to exist, you know, as far as the other midshipmen were concerned. And this incident actually uh, received a lot of attention. And uh, to his credit, uh, the assistant secretary of the Navy at the time, uh, Theodore Roosevelt Jr., uh, basically uh, made it a, uh, a significant incident, and there was uh, there were there was quite a bit of fallout as a result of that. But uh, but it does indicate something of the atmosphere of the Navy at the time. But uh, we should note that that the Navy was very little different in that way than the rest of American society. Well, let's uh, let's turn to the technology, which is so much uh, a part of of your book, and so much a part of Rickover's life. Why was the innovation of a nuclear-powered ship, nuclear-powered submarine, so momentous? Uh, we know what was going on in the world, uh, particularly uh, after the war, Soviet Union, very aggressive, uh, working towards uh, a nuclear weapon, which it did, exploded in 19, I think 1949, um, and working also in terms of ratcheting up its technology in terms of its Navy. Um, so how did it all come together? The technology, the need, uh, and, and Rickover. Yeah, okay. So let's, let's jump back a, a little bit, and that's to just uh, prior to the U.S. entry into World War II. The Navy had already begun some small experiments with nuclear fission, with the idea that, so breaking the nucleus of a, of a uranium atom has the potential to release almost unlimited energy. Now, just to put it into a sort of uh, concretize the idea, it would t if you crack the nucleus of one atom, you can create enough energy to cause uh, a bean to jump off a table. That would take millions of molecules of oil to do the same thing. So you, you have so much potential energy within, uh, within these uranium atoms. And nuclear fission had been discovered, and the idea of a chain reaction had been discovered, that if you break one nucleus, it will release energy that will cause neighboring nuclei to break. And you begin to set off this chain reaction. Well, that immediately raises the possibility. You can do one of two things. You can have an uncontrolled chain reaction effectively a bomb, or you can harness it potentially and somehow place it within a chamber. And that chamber could be used to capture the energy, the heat energy that was generated in the course of the breakdown of these, of these nuclei. So the Navy began some small experiments, but then it was stopped when the world, uh, the world went to war. The U.S. was devoting all of its uh, uh, scientific and technological uh, capabilities to developing the bomb. And so you come out of World War II, and basically in the, the, the world's eye, and uh, especially with the U.S., is the idea of these two uh, atomic bombs that were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and incinerated these cities. And the idea that you would stick this same energy inside of a vessel uh, both a chamber and a surrounding vessel seemed uh, absolutely insane. Well, but it was still within the realm of possibility, long-term possibility. Uh, the United States was principally devoted in its atomic energy research after the war in developing uh, uh, its uh, uh, more nuclear weapons. The U.S. understood that it had this technological lead uh, and it was uh, investing heavily in that. Well, the Navy was searching for what its role could be after World War II, after the arrival of the atomic bomb. What kind of Navy can you have 
when, uh, when you have a world with atomic weapons. So the Navy as sort of a, a gesture in this direction created a small group that they sent to Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where the Manhattan Project had taken, uh, been centered and uh, to investigate you know, what was being learned about nuclear reactors. Primarily at that time, nuclear reactors were these giant, uh, they called them piles because uh, they were created out of uh, piles of graphite bricks and uh, they were used either for experimentation or to develop fuels to be used in bombs. Well, Rick Over goes there in an inimitable way he takes a, a, he manages to take command of the Navy group that was sent there, and they uh, and he sets to learning everything that they could uh, about nuclear reactors and their potential. Uh, now Rickover uh, was at this point he had uh, he was an engineer during World War II. Uh, he very successfully ran what was called the electrical section within the Navy, they were responsible for all electrical systems within the Navy's ships, uh, had tremendous, he had tremendous success at that, but he was also known as a son of a bitch and as somebody who was just impossible to get along with, but he got stuff done. So the Navy figured, well, if anybody could possibly figure out what opportunity there could be here within uh, reactors for the Navy, and it had always been this dream. Well, if you could put a reactor into a ship of some kind, you could basically power it around the world without having to go in and, and refuel. So Rickover put together this group. They began to study the reactor, and he started to realize this is an engineering problem. It's not a discovery problem. It's not a scientific problem that requires tremendous uh, research that could go on for decades, that it's actually possible to take this and figure out how you could contain it and then figure out whether that, that what you've contained it within is going to weigh so much that it uh, will destroy the buoyancy of whatever uh, ship you put it on, uh, whether you could create it such that you could actually control that reaction within it, and most importantly, whether you could create it in a fashion that would be safe enough for sailors and officers to be around it. You know, the, uh, you're talking about something that's spewing out radiation. And if that radiation uh, reaches the, you know, the, the sailors and officers on the vessel, they're not going to survive. So tremendous amount of engineering work that had to be done. But Rickover set himself to do it. Now, uh, just to indicate some of the disdain that Rickover was held in, after he came back to Washington from this Oak Ridge venture, uh, the Navy was uh, just didn't really see that we were going to be able to have practical reactors. And they had other problems on their mind uh, because uh, the Air Force was getting all the budgets because the Air Force was uh, able to carry the bombs and launch the ground ground based mis missiles. And so they they relegated Rick over to a back hallway, an office that was a former ladies restroom that still had the fixtures in the wall. And he never let the Navy forget that. Uh, well, he was a, he was a, a naval iconoclast. Uh, he, um, he wouldn't be denied. Uh, he also, uh, I, uh, from what I read, uh, rarely wore his uniform. He preferred to, uh, to wear a suit. I just say that the uniform thing seems like, oh, let me just spite the Navy. But no, it wasn't. He wanted, he believed in a hierarchy of the mind, not a hierarchy of rank. And so he actually insisted, actually going back, right back to the electrical section in World War II. But once he had his own organization for, for uh, the Navy reactors, he insisted that uniforms were banned there. Naval regulations were banned there because he said the lowest ensign should be able to tell an admiral when he's wrong about technology. You know, what mattered was not what your rank was, but what your, how you thought. And he was absolutely insistent on that. So banning what uniforms wasn't just to poke his finger in the Navy's eye. But he 
again, wouldn't wouldn't be denied, even though it, along the way there were so many roadblocks to what it is he was trying to accomplish. I want to talk about Congress for a second because he had some good friends in Congress. There was a, a joint committee in the Congress on, on atomic energy uh, that was headed by Senator Brian McMahon. McMahon was from Connecticut, uh, which is where the, the Groton shipyard is. Uh, and um, a congressman, then congressman, later senator, uh, Scoop Jackson um, from the state of Washington was also a member. And these were people who believed in, in Rickover. And I think that this, from what you write, this really got him so far, uh, notwithstanding these roadblocks. Yeah, 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 um, absolutely. You know, Rick Over at one point said uh, something to the effect of, I'm a creature of Congress. Without, uh, he was testifying on Capitol Hill, he said, without you, um, I would not be here. And uh, incidentally, he would go to Capitol Hill and never wear his uniform, even though it was a standing order from the Navy that you must wear your uniform when testifying on Capitol Hill. Uh, Rick Over in uh, 1952, so he had, the Navy had uh, finally, uh, with the new Atomic Energy Commission, what is today the Department of Energy, created a, a joint civilian Navy organization focused on the development of nuclear power reactors. After you mentioned the Soviet uh, getting the bomb, uh, after that, there was uh, a much ratcheting up of investment in future potential for, um, for all kinds of, of uh, weaponry, but including uh, the nuclear submarine. Um, so Rickover was eventually made head of the of uh, what was called naval reactors, this joint committee, uh, this joint organization, where he effectively had two hats. He could uh, he could li he would literally write himself a letter on uh, Atomic Energy Commission Division of uh, of uh, Nuclear Reactors letterhead saying we're going to budget so much money uh, for the some aspect of the uh, development of nuclear reactor for the Navy. And then he would take that to his higher up, the budget uh, officers at the Navy and say to them, hey, look at this. The Atomic Energy Commission has, uh, is putting money into this. It would be really embarrassing if the Navy doesn't match this. And he would literally do this going back and forth and back and forth. He knew how to pull those, le those power levers within, you know, within the government. But what really mattered was that he had these friends on Capitol Hill. He was getting stuff done. He promised a timeline from when he began of five years to put a, a, a submarine to sea. This, this was unheard of. It takes five years for the Navy to change uh, a, a uniform style. You know? And he was saying, we're going to put an, a completely new type of, of propulsion system, a revolutionary propulsion system into a submarine. And uh, this is going to change the world. Now, if, if you don't mind me taking a minute here, I'd like to go back so we understand what previous uh, submarines were. You know, because now we accept the idea that a, a, a submarine can submerge and remain under the ocean for months at a time, effectively until provisions run out, that, um, uh, that they can uh, run on nuclear power in the most treacherous conditions, seas, 50-foot seas, uh, more than a 1,000 feet under the ocean, under tremendous pressure, uh, coming through the ice uh, at the North Pole, transiting under the North Pole, the the Northwest Passage there, the, uh, this, these are things that we accept now. This was an impossibility before Rick Gover came along. Submarine during World War II was a surface vessel that could, would power up batteries on the surface using diesel generators as it went along. And then when it came time to uh, either to submerge for attack or for flight, it would go under the surface and could remain under the surface 
for a matter of hours uh, at high power or days at low power. So it was uh, a completely different type of vessel. And it was incredibly dangerous. And in fact, during World War II, uh, the most high, the service branches with the highest casualty rates uh, for every Navy in the world were the submarines. You know, whether it was the German U-boats, the Japanese, or the U.S. or the Brits, you know, this is uh, where casualty rates were highest. It was a very dangerous operation. And so that the Rickover accomplished this within five years of completely transforming it. And that, you know, that process won him friends on con- in Congress. And he did it on time and on budget. You know, people in Congress back then, they loved anybody who would actually uh, hit their budget numbers. I remember uh, I was, uh, and he did, he hit his marks in terms of the, uh, the prediction that this could be done. Uh, people saying it's gotta be 10 years. Did it in five. I remember as a kid, the Nautilus, everybody knew Rickover's name and they knew the, the USS Nautilus, uh, which, which was the first. Um, I want to just to follow up on how this all happened. If I were to encapsulate it, it, it seems to me is this was a man who just demanded excellence. There were so many people who were involved in these various projects that he was had overseen mm-hmm. and that this could not have happened. And he would be the first to admit that this could not happen without having the very best of the best who were working with you to accomplish the task. Yeah. 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 Uh, Rick over was a, a harsh taskmaster. He was, he said, the more I, the, the more I like you, the more I value, value you, the harder I'll be on you. He could swear a blue streak. He spared no one. He didn't care whether you were the uh, uh, Lord Mountbatten, uh, you know, whom he came to know well, uh, or um, or the most brilliant engineer there is. Um, but he demanded that everybody take responsibility for what they were doing, and he gave people responsibility. You know, this is this is something that. Uh, that Rickover really drove home. He, from from the first time he had command of men uh, under him, he gave people responsibility. And you either uh, thrived on the the opportunity to ha- to accomplish something extraordinary, uh, and to uh, and loved the idea that you had responsibility for it, and you were expected to achieve it. Or you moved out, or you got moved out, and fast. Uh, but he expected people to be at work six days a week, and, and then often a seventh as well. Uh, he expected them to arrive at by eight in the morning and to stay there until at least six at night. And nobody worked harder than he did. He demanded attention to detail. Uh, one of his favorite saying was, sayings was, the devil is in the detail. And he said, so is salvation. And he expected people to have attention to details to the nth degree. Uh, And when you think about it, if you are creating something that is incredibly dangerous, a nuclear reactor is dangerous. You know, right now we're dealing with this this war going on around uh, the Zaporizhia uh, nuclear power plant. And we understand that there is potential for grave harm. But the idea that you would stick this reactor inside a vessel and you needed to be safe enough that people would want to be in that vessel. And then not just that, you needed it to be safe enough that an American uh, submarine could sail into a friendly port somewhere around the world uh, or, or other ship. And right now, you know, here we are 60 plus years later and American ships are uh, including nuclear carriers are welcomed in ports around the world because there has never been a nuclear power incident in the United States Navy's after millions of hours of operation uh, and millions of miles of operations, never been any kind of nuclear incident. And you go compare what happened with the Soviet and Russian navies. They have had many casualties and they've caused some serious environmental harm. 
Well, he, uh, Admiral Rickover uh, served uh, many, many years. Um, how did, a couple of questions here as we conclude, um, how did his naval career come to an end? He just, it seemed like it was kind of open-ended. Yeah. Yeah. So Rickover, uh, we, we have not talked uh, really about that, how Congress forced the Navy to promote him. Uh, early on, the Navy was trying to oust him while he was in the midst of developing these uh, the nuclear reactor and the first nuclear submarine, the USS Nautilus, uh, which is now um, home ported in, um, in, back in Groton, where it was built. Um, but Congress forced the Navy to promote him. And that's, that's a, a tale in itself. And every uh, couple of years, uh, the Navy realized uh, the political cost of not retaining the admiral, not promoting him, was so high that they just then allowed him to continue it and hoped he would eventually uh, age out. He became friends of presidents. He uh, and in the, the apotheosis of his career, Jimmy Carter, a former nuclear submarine officer, became president. And Carter wanted Rickover as an advisor, a confidant, and a kind of mentor to him. And so uh, this Jew from a Polish stedel became welcomed in the Oval Office, uh, welcomed in the, uh, in the uh, family quarters in the West Wing at the, uh, or it, within the White House. Um, but the, the Navy still disliked this man. He was 81 years old. Uh, Ronald Reagan defeated Jimmy Carter. The Secretary of Navy said that Rick overran what he called a commissariat within the Navy, and that he, and he called a, naval reactors a Gestapo. You know, harsh words for a Jew from from Poland, somebody who who understood well what that meant. Uh, but you know, he Rick Over's uh, supporters. You know, you live long enough. The people you know, the people who support you, they start to fade away. And Rickover's power was waning on Capitol Hill. And finally, they, he was forced out. 81, uh, at age 81, there were lots of questions about whether he was in, uh, still had the same level of mental capacity that he'd had. Um, and uh, as he said at a tribute dinner where there were th uh, three presidents in attendance, this old admiral is not going to fade away. And uh, he continued on, he lived on for another uh, five years and um, uh, was engaged in setting up an uh, educational foundation. Um, you mentioned that he was, uh, he gave, uh, or we had talked before that he gave fun money from his uh, speeches. He was invited to give speeches often. And uh, he gave that money to a Jewish orphanage in Chicago and uh, uh, continued on uh, for a period um, at the end of his life uh, when he uh, passed away. He had that B'nai B'rith uh, award on his mantelpiece. Um, Rabbi Bruce Kahn, who was Navy chaplain, uh, who was brought in by his, uh, by his widow uh, at his death, uh, his wife said to him, he's, uh, he's, he was a Jew, he should have a Jewish burial. Uh, which Rabbi Khan officiated at uh, Arlington Cemetery. You know, it, it seems to me, because he served so long, mm -hmm. that his indispensability was his brilliance. His, not only his because he was a smart guy, mm -hmm. but that he was a problem solver in addition to being a visionary. And, mm -hmm. and that's a rare combination. Yeah. Um, so in, in looking at his, his legacy today, in the Navy and beyond, how, how would you assess it? Uh, well, that's, that's, that's a great question and it's a great uh, summation. Um, so I had lunch uh, last, uh, last spring with John Richardson, Admiral John Richardson, who had been the uh, Chief of Naval Operations for, under President Obama, so the, the top dog. But before that, he had been the head of naval reactors. So the, the, the same, the organization that Admiral Rickover started, he said every day and in every way, Rickover's fingerprints are everywhere within naval reactors and in the Navy. You know, you're talking about 
somebody whose influence uh, we can point to it in some sort of very specific achievements, the nuclear carriers that project American power around the world, our nuclear submarines that serve as a deterrent force. You know, uh, when Putin talks about possibly using nuclear weapons, uh, you know, he, he may have, he may be evil, but he knows that would be suicide. So we are protected by what Rickover did. Uh, when nuclear power is used uh, to generate energy around the world, this is the same technology that Rickover first created. The possibilities for that derive directly from his, both his brilliance, as you said, his engineering capabilities, his organizational leadership, and his understanding of just how important it was to do these things safely and with attention, absolute attention to detail. And that legacy, which you see in the safe operation of American naval vessels, the, uh, what the nuclear power industry is a separate matter because he didn't have oversight over it. Uh, and in many ways, that's unfortunate. But that capacity to, to lead an organization that is defined by its, basically by perfection, perfection uh, is unmatched and is something that all of us should learn from. Uh, and that sense that you are responsible. You are responsible for what you do within that organization. And it should, again, be something that, with something, a sensibility that we've perhaps lost. But, uh, but Rickover demanded. And that continues. Well, Mark Workman's new biography, Admiral Hyman Rickover, Engineer of Power, part of the Yale Jewish Live series, is available wherever you purchase books. Mark, thank you for sharing your research and your insights into Admiral Rickover's incredible story and his incredible contributions to all of us. Uh, best of luck with the book. Thank you, Dan. I really appreciate you having me on. Well, thank you again to historian and author Mark Workman for guiding us through the extraordinary life and career of Admiral Hyman Rickover. And thank you for tuning in to this conversation with B'nai Brith. Now, if you enjoyed this interview, make sure you tune into all of our programs by subscribing to the B'nai B'rith YouTube channel and by liking us on Facebook. And be sure to visit our website, B'nai to learn more about our important work, including our efforts supporting Ukrainian refugees, as well as those still within Ukraine's borders more than six months into the war. For my guest, Mark Wortman, and for B'nai B'rith, I'm Dan Mariashin. Join us again soon.